Christy Kay. Welcome to Business Life After Hours, a podcast that takes a deep dive into real life topics at the intersection of business and life. After the workday ends, that's where we pick up. Our topic on this Business Life After Hours podcast is Building Cooking Confidence with America's Test Kitchen. This podcast episode is for anyone who desires more confident cooking skills, who'd like to gain greater intelligence on all things in the kitchen, and hear from the experts who dive deep to bring us more. Are you waving the kitchen SOS flag? Wow, do we have answers for you from the kitchen gurus. My guests are hosts from the most watched PBS TV cooking show, America's Test Kitchen. Bridget Lancaster and Julia Collin Davidson are in the house. They've spent years showing us how it's done in the kitchen and building our knowledge on everything we never knew but should have known, from the deliciousness of our food to our pans and our coffee. You name it, they are the chefs, they are gurus, and they are here on Business Life After Hours. Welcome, Bridget, and welcome, Julia. Thank you for having us. Thank you. So thrilled you're here to share some kitchen knowledge with all of us. So as your website (laughs) says, you help curious cooks become confident cooks. So the two of you as hosts, you lead test cooks to present foolproof recipes. You share the the results of the recipes and equipment reviews. You do taste tests. It's so awesome. So collectively, how long have the two of you been doing this cooking business thing? Oh, but Bridget and I have been together on TV for over 20, 23 years now, I think we're going on. Yes. And we've been working and knowing each other for... A thousand years. There <laughs> yes. was... Fire yeah. was discovered and then we started cooking, <laughs> yeah, I think is what it was. Yeah. No, 98, 99 is yeah. when we first met each other at work. Um, and we rose up through the ranks together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we're instant friends. So uh, I would have figured that knowing the two of you and your personalities, I could see how you just clicked right away. <laughs> yes. Fast friends. <laughs> Definitely. Yep, mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. So much fun. So television cooking shows in general, especially on PBS, they're they're popular and they're competitive. So what is it with America's Test Kitchen that resonates so much with the huge audiences that you have? And I know we've talked off of the microphone about people resonating with you as soon as they see you or they hear your voice, they recognize you. Yep. So what is it, do you think, that is the most sort of compelling for the audience? Well, I think one of the things is that we offer recipes that work and they can have the confidence that if they're going to spend their time, they're going to spend their money making something, um, that they can be assured that it's going to work. Mm -hmm. And I think we probably connect with a lot of people because we've been there with them for some special times in their lives, Mm -hmm. you know, baptisms, holidays, weddings, uh, reunions. People will reach out to Julia and I, or they'll stop us on the street and they'll say, oh, you were with me uh, when I tried to cook something for my first date with, Mm -hmm. you know, the woman who's now my wife. So it's really special for us too. Um, But I think there's a connection with our audience. Yeah. I also think there's just not a lot of fluff on our shows. (laughs) It is hardcore information. It's presented in a really straightforward manner. Um, The the, sort of the camaraderie we have is just natural. It just comes out of hanging out with each other. It's not forced. It's not scripted. And it's the star of the show is the food. It always has been. That's been our mantra since day one. Let's show the food and let's not only show you how it works, but explain why it works Mm -hmm. so that you can watch us make it, but then you'll know how to make it at home and why why it works better than the way you were doing it before or what have you. Um, I think it's the lack of fluff and all the extra information we've had in that makes it feel like you know us and it makes it popular. It's so true. I will say that we do like marshmallow fluff. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that is the one fluff that we will put on the show. Some fluff yeah. is incorporated. Of course. <laughs> yes, yes, necessary. Indeed. But I that's my cup of tea, by the way, is just like cut to the chase. Give me the facts. And as we've said, too, it's like you offer th- – knowledge and information that we didn't even know we needed and then you gave it to me and I'm like wow how did I not ever think that I needed to know that but I absolutely do right well I think that happens when you cook at home right you make a dish and you think uh next time I'm going to change a little something and then you make it and every time you change it make it a little better and a little better or they don't have the ingredient brand you usually use so you substitute and it's better or worse I mean that's our recipe development process in a nutshell except it's much more scripted and we know what the variable is so we'll cook a recipe 30 to 15 times 30 to 50 times and we'll cook three batches four or five batches at the same time changing one variable so you can see what the effect of that variable is on the food and that's how you learn why a recipe works or doesn't work wow yeah so, like, start to finish on a recipe like that, mm-hmm. how long does, does it take you? A couple months. A couple months. Two months. Yeah, wow. two months on a good 
good day. There have been recipes that we've had to delay publishing the recipe, either in the cookbooks or the magazines, because they're a little problematic. And mm-hmm. those those might continue another another month or another two months after that. Mm-hmm. Yes. You know? yes. Especially yes. if it's seasonal items and yeah. things like that. Yep. So, Julia, what is your first memory of cooking? Oh, um, it is making a loaf of bread. It was, we weren't allowed to have white bread in the house, but you, if I made it, I could eat it. Because my mother was whole grains only, only whole wheat, dark pumpernickel German bread. And um, my mother was sick in bed with a fever. My brother was off at of camp. My father was at work and I was bored. And I was six, I could read six, seven, eight, and we had all the ingredients. And so I, my mother said I popped up into her bedroom every once in a while to ask her where something was or what this meant in the cookbook. And it was a Julia Child cookbook, who was also known for testing her recipes. Uh, and she said hours later, I came up with white bread. Now, I don't know if it was the bread that Julia Child had intended, but it was edible and I was happy. <laughs> I was, was eating edible. white bread and I'd made it myself. And that was a very clear uh, indication that I was, what I was gonna do, because I, at first I loved to eat. And if you love to eat, that naturally leads you to love to cook. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. And then, Bridget, who was your inspiration when you started cooking? Um, I'd say I have three inspirations. My mom was a great cook, so she showed me the way. Uh, My grandfather was a great baker. He really took an an interest in German and Austrian pastries, Mm -hmm. taught me a lot on the pastry side of it. And then Julia Child, I, I have to say she was... She was on my TV in the background, like in between this old house and Yankee Workshop. It was, you know, Julia Child was there showing us not only how to cook, but that making mistakes can also kind of be fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Those were the best times. And then, of course, Dan Aykroyd as Julia Child. (laughs) (laughs) Who can forget? Right. (laughs) That's great. I love that. So, Julia, what's the best part of your job? Eating. (laughs) <laughs> eating. I mean, I as I mentioned earlier, I love to eat. I'm not kidding. I love eating random things for breakfast. As I show up the test kitchen, it's not unusual that you're having lamb stew, lamb chops, fried chicken. I mean, really unusual things for breakfast, and I love it. Um, I um, and I love all the different flavors. I just it carries me through, and I love then thinking about how to make that accessible to someone who's never cooked it, never had it, lives in a different part of the country. I want them to taste this. How do we make it so they can taste this? Because I want them to taste this. It's like you consider everything a challenge. Like, how do I get this to happen? How do I get this in front of somebody else if they can make it? Yes. And that's exciting to me. Mm -hmm. How about you, Bridget? What's the favorite part of your job on a daily basis? I think it's hanging out with a collection of people that are so interested in food like myself. I mean, how many people can be in a room and geek out about fish sauce? Yes. I mean, Mm. that's an odd group of people. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Or geek out about barbecue sauce or, you know, talk for hours about the difference between North Carolina, Western North Carolina, and Eastern North Carolina Mm -hmm. barbecue sauces. These are my people. These are my (laughs) tribe. And I'm really, really just happy to be able to talk food all the time. You know, I really thought you were going to answer with cheese. (laughs) You haven't asked me, you know, what I eat 24-7 yet. (laughs) So as we talk on Business Life After Hours, here we are after the work day. Talk to us about when you're winding down Mm. from the day. You said it, winding. Winding down. Yeah, you you. nailed it. Getting that uh, that (laughs) message here. So, what does it look like? So, do you when you're done? I'm sure your days are long. You have so much production. You have so many things in the test kitchen going on. What does that look like for you both? Well, winding down for me, depending on if my son has some sort of football practice or basketball practice. You know, that during depends on if my winding down happens at six or happens at 10.30 at Mm. night. Uh, But winding down for me is um, putting some sort of meal on the table. Sometimes it's very hurried, but I try to have uh, what I call butts and seats at the table. (laughs) I want us to all look at each other as we're eating. You must have that. Um, And uh, maybe prepare some food maybe prepare some food for the next day too while I'm at it. So I do a lot of might as well cooking. Mm. Mm. Uh, So while I am cooking, say, a a pork tenderloin in the oven, roasting that, I'll be roasting some chicken legs too. So that might be tomorrow's meal today. Um, And I think the other thing is uh, I like a nice big glass of beer. Oh. Yeah, yeah, I'm a beer girl. I like to make beer. beer. Oh. Yeah, I like to make beer. My husband and I have made beer for close to 30 years now. Uh, We have uh, five 
keg keezer in our basement, which mm-hmm. makes me sound really sad, but we're very popular. She loves going to do laundry. <laughs> yes, yes, it's right next to the washer dryer. <laughs> Do your teenagers ever kind of disappear downstairs for a minute? We have locks on our on our taps. Yes, but I love it. You said one of them is root beer. Yes. Oh, so one yes. of the five. Yes. So yes, we have a nitro tap. So one of them will always be something like a stout, uh, and then one of them is a cream. Might be a cream soda or definitely root beer. Root beer is a big favorite. Very nice. Now, what about mm-hmm. you, Julia? Uh, it's a combination of some sort of exercise. Uh, I like stretching and exercising in the morning, but in the in the evening, I'm I sorry I play pickleball, oh, and yes. don't get me started about pickleball. Yes, I, it's, don't get her started about pickleball. Uh, there's two things I can wax on about. One is roast chicken, and the other is pickleball. <laughs> um, and I'm pretty lousy at pickleball, which makes me want to talk about it more. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love so my husband and I play pickleball with friends or family, um, just moving around, getting outside. And I have a 14 year old daughter, and so hanging out with her. And I mentioned the wine. Um, I love wine. I worked in wineries in Napa. I was what they called a cellar rat, which is a really not nice term for people who work in wine cellars. And so uh, we crushed grapes, we uh, we fermented the wines, and I was in, uh, did a lot of that, and champagnes. And it's just, I love opening a bottle of wine and smelling it and having that first sip or two. It just, it, for me, it is a reset uh, into the evening's going to be fun. I'm going to enjoy the family. I'm going to get outside and play a little pickleball. And uh, yeah, that's my reset. I love that. America's next test sport. Yeah. You do something on pickleball. Yes. <laughs> right. Well, it's got pickle in the name. And yes. if you've ever played it, there's a part of the court called the kitchen. Oh, no. Yes. It's right around the net uh, when you volley. Um, and so a volley isn't called a volley in pickleball. It's called, I can't believe they named it this. They called it a dink. And so... Um, on Fridays, we have what's called dinks and drinks. <laughs> <laughs> it's perfect. I can. Yeah. I really can see some diversification yeah. here. Yep. Some some more branding <laughs> opportunities. Branching for, out here. Yep. Branching yep. out. Well, America's Test Kitchen is an instructional cooking show. It offers great advice, techniques for cooking tips. But first of all, you're both incredible teachers as well, with great style in your instruction. So on top of that, though, you are both editorial executive editorial directors. So what that means is you're setting kind of that tone, picking the topics for the viewers Mm -hmm. and the readers. And I'm wondering, how on earth do you prioritize the topics that you (laughs) that you cover, the recipes, the the products? How do you even begin to make that list and then cover those? Yeah, the lineups take a good three, four months before Mm -hmm. we even get started on pre-production and really mapping out the recipes. Uh, But the lineups are based on what people want to see from us and also uh, what has been recently published in the cookbooks and the two magazines, depending on the, the two TV shows. And we also take into consideration the holidays or any kind of seasonality. Um, And, uh, uh, regional shows. We do a lot of regional shows for Cook's Country. So we'll start off with a um, on the road segment where we visited a barbecue place or a, a, a roast chicken place, maybe. Mm, if only. Uh, if only, <laughs> yes. Julia's Pickleball Roast Chicken oh, Shack. Oh, wow. Why did I yeah. never think of that before? Oh. Pickle chicken. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh, um, it's coming together right here. <laughs> but, but all of these, and we work with the uh, the uh, editor-in-chiefs of the different magazines, mm-hmm. too, to make sure, see what they're really invested in and really interested in. Because if you can get people that are so super excited about presenting their own food on television, that just makes it easier for us. Yeah, mm-hmm. and we really think about the different types of cooking. We make sure there's, we call them Tuesday night suppers. It's a supper that you need to get on the table when everyone's got stuff going on. It needs to be healthy. It needs to be quick. It needs to be accessible accessible needs to please a wide variety of palettes you have to have a number of those some uh, then we call uh, bigger recipes we call internally project pieces and it might be something you wanted to tackle like making homemade croissants or a baked Alaska it might be something you'll never make like croissants or baked Alaska but you want to see how it's done right and watch us make it Mm -hmm. so you slot a few of those in there you think about holidays and what um, people issues people have with holidays whether it's timing whether it's shopping whether it's prep ahead Um, and so we make sure we fill all those gaps when you talk about being moms of teenagers what 
after a busy day do you put on the table for those teenagers? What is your go-to kind of a quick yet healthy mm. meal that you can say, okay, this is my tried and true. This is one that like never fails. The kids love it. It's easy, but it's healthy. What, what, do, you, what do you think, Rachel? Well, might I suggest a cheese board? <laughs> a cheese board. You always, Bridget's in love with cheese and cheese. Her middle name um, is cheese. It's Bridget yeah. Cheese Lancaster. Yes, yes. Well, maybe, maybe I'll change it to that. Maybe I'll change it to Gouda or something. Um, I do, as I mentioned before, I do a lot of might as well cooking. So, And we also will have cook days where we make sure to keep protein Mm-hmm. cooked and ready in the fridge yeah, and maybe same. lightly sauteed vegetables is there uh, as well and then you can easily make a wrap a sandwich something like that mm-hmm. a salad um, and take it on the go or you know eat it quickly at home yeah we make a big bowl of uh, tuna salad uh, which the whole family loves and we poach chicken boneless skinless chicken breasts sounds boring but if they're poached and cooked you can make anything out of that in a heartbeat or if you're really on the run Dice it up, throw it in a bag, and take it in the car. Yeah. And if you have that, I do crudite. Um, crudite, I love crudite dinners. I call them cold dinner. But everyone gets vegetables. Maybe you'll pull out the poached chicken, maybe some cheese. Oh. I was going to say, and crudite is the vegetables of the cheese board. <laughs> 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 but that's my go-to. Everyone loves crudite. So we've talked a little bit to uh, off the microphone here about something that is near and dear to my heart, the issue of food allergies and mm-hmm. severe food allergies. Mm-hmm. And I wanted you to address that just because I know millions of Americans are affected by it, whether it's you know peanuts, tree nuts, sesame, eggs, dairy. Um, I am sure through the years that you've been involved in cooking that this has certainly become more of an issue as those numbers continue to increase. Mm -hmm. How has that impacted your job, your cooking, your recipes in terms of addressing some of those needs that impact so many Americans? Well, I think one of the things is people feel more comfortable letting us know about it. And I think food allergies have always been there and people have just kind of sat in silence and said no thank you I can't have that for one reason or another so now we're hearing about it which is great because it allows us to make more informed choices as we do testing Mm -hmm. and because we've been around for a few years now we're able to go back to our recipes and maybe modify them or change them to work with things like coconut uh, milk instead of cow milk or dairy uh, to work with coconut fat instead of or coconut oil instead of butter um, to make vegan choices to make diabetes uh, we have a diabetic cookbook we have all these different um, avenues now and the book department which Julia is near and dear to she had Mm. that up for a while they're really able to take these deep dives into more single subject uh, items like that yeah I think the focus on the nutritional values and allergies of food is now a topic that people talk about all the time and before I think it was not talked about as openly and so before our recipes never had a nutritional analysis now every recipe does and before we never would offer gluten-free or dairy-free options now we do Mm. for many of our recipes not all but we're getting there um so i think it is part of like the culture yeah. that it's okay to talk about it and let's let's it's get true. this out there and yeah i and love that i love that so much because i know people who don't have food allergies don't recognize the severity of it so this is mm-hmm. great i That's love right. that you're addressing those 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 needs so what is one of the most unusual dishes that you've ever prepared or tested that comes to mind something that you would have been like that would never be on my list I can't believe I'm making this right now (laughs) oh there's one dish I mean it sounds lovely but it sounds really too hard and I make it all the time it's grilled paella so it's it's not that hard and um it's it's accessible it's easy and it is delicious Mm -hmm. and we did it on tv and i remember when i saw the recipe i thought this is going to be a project piece it's not and what's more impressive is that it brings the house down every time i make it so if you want to look like a rock star and you have people coming over um you prep everything you set it by the grill and then you're looking like you have you know no care in the world as you put together this fabulous meal (laughs) i mean it is yeah yeah I, i think a couple um food items from this past season uh, comes to mind. One is, um, oh, now they're the bouche de Noël, or the, the, oh, the Yule log cake. Yeah. And it comes with mini, mar- uh, mini meringue mushrooms, and it comes with chocolate dirt. I'm doing the air quotes here. <laughs> um, it has a, a hazelnut filling and a chocolate cake and frosting. It's absolutely beautiful. Mm. And then the other one is beef wellington. Oh, that's just kind a of a recipe. meat bouche de Noël, oh. right? If you think about it. <laughs> yeah, that's um, a good way to put it. And there's and, so many bad recipes for wellington out yes. there. This one is incredible. Bulletproof. Yeah. 
It Absolutely. really is. Yeah. I remember I made it for my husband and it, it was the one thing it doesn't have in it is pate. Mm-hmm. And he, you know, he's, a, he's, uh, he, how could it not have pate? I mean, he really wanted to stick to it. And then he ate it because it has prosciutto instead of pate. And he looked at me and said, you know, this is better. Uh-huh. And yeah, yeah. It says, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So do your husbands cook? Yes. Yes, my husband's a chef. Yes. My husband yeah. was a chef. Yeah. Competition? No. In the household? No, he no. can cook anytime he wants. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I actually met my husband at America's Test Kitchen. He was hired on season two. So when you're in front of the camera, uh, you don't film everything. You know, if, if something has to cook for 10 minutes, you have what's called a twin come out. So it's that food cooked to the next stage because everything's so expensive, the lighting, the camera crew. And so you have all these pots in the background of the that recipe cooked to different levels. <laughs> you need a lot of people to make all that background So food. that's the people walking around Those are the on people. the yes, show. Yes, they're actually doing stuff. Ding, ding, ding. Yeah. Okay. And so in season two, um, w- everyone that worked there was on camera. There was this tiny staff, so they had to hire people. And I think it was Bridget that was cooking roast turkey with Jim McGravy. Oh, my goodness. And It's a flashback. Yeah. And we hadn't figured all this out yet, the filming, the nuances of how to put <laughs> it together. And so there was no giblets in the house. They'd all been used, except for giblets in a frozen and a solid frozen. turkey. And so we stopped, we stopped filming. Cameras went down while this dude hacked through a solid frozen turkey to get oh. the giblets. And he broke a cleaver. And he laughed and he grabbed another night. And I said, who is that dude? <laughs> oh, we were dating oh. by the end of the week. Yeah, that's, first date, so that's my guy. That's your guy. I love that. That's I met my day. husband at a bar. Yeah. <laughs> so I've got nothing. <laughs> Was he drinking beer? <laughs> yes, and we had cheese together, as a matter of fact. <laughs> I believe it might have been queso. <laughs> That's great. America's Test Kitchen is a TV show with so much brand growth through the years. There's TV and a digital TV show, podcast, cookbooks, apps, magazines, recipe development, online cooking classes, all of these things you're doing, all associated with America's Test Kitchen. I don't know how you do it. Mm-hmm. I don't know how you do what you do. But is there a particular part of that that is really your favorite part that you just say, I want more of that? Give me more of that particular um role within this job well I mean cook's country is always near and dear to me I head up the recipe development for that for for many years and I love that it was the magazine that really started to take a regional approach to American cooking and really highlight maybe the lesser told stories uh, about people that make the food that we eat Um, and it's just been a real pleasure to see cook's country evolve over the years as well um, and offer people um, quick recipes and value for their food. Um, and I think, I think that that part of our company is probably going to grow, uh, you know, thinking about today's economy, um, people are looking value in their food and mm-hmm. that is a great place to live. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love TV. I love filming TV. I love behind the scenes. I like watching it all come together. I like putting together the episodes the year ahead of time and thinking about it. Um, and I just started my own television show called Julia at Home. It's on Pluto TV. Um, I'm finishing season four right now. And I'm cooking in my house. Uh, my husband is doing the dishes and prep in the basement. <laughs> my dear friend um, is next to me off camera making sure I have what I need. My daughter, who's 14, is the PA. Uh, she gets paid in Legos. But she told me when she's 15, <laughs> according to Massachusetts State Law, she can finally get a paycheck. She looked it up. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's real home. My dog's on camera, and so and what I do is I highlight the food from the cookbooks, which as Bridget said earlier, I head up the cookbook department for many years, and there are some real gems that don't get the TV focus, and so I love going into the cookbooks, pulling out these recipes, and showing how they fit into sort of a home lifestyle. Oh my gosh, that's an incredible. You go so deep into this world of cooking, both of you. I just love that. So... Do you find yourselves when you're eating, whether it's after hours or throughout the day, are you counting calories? Do you count fat grams? Do you count macros? Do you look at sugar? Does that come into play at all? What about you, Bridget? so annoying. Yeah, it is kind of annoying. Well, I mean, only if someone's looking. (laughs) Then then I'll count. Um, I, I try not to. I just try to eat healthy. I do watch... I watch a lot of food go down my gullet, but uh, I I do watch, uh, I try to watch my carbohydrates as I'm getting older. That seems to be the thing that's my little hiccup. Um, And um, there are zero carbohydrates in cheese. (laughs) (laughs) But I think it's something that as we, uh, as we get a little older, we're, we're just more aware of. 
Mm-hmm. But yeah. moving is a great way to, to offset yes. the calorie intake. Did I ever mention pickleball? Yes. Um, <laughs> um, that has come up. Yeah. <laughs> I need all the help I can get. I, I need to know what I'm eating. And I, there is a log I keep in the back of my head. I don't necessarily adhere to it, but I, I do. Get, there's a ticker in the back of my head yeah. knowing where I go off, mm-hmm. which is most of the time. <laughs> um, and the older I get, the more important it is that I pay attention to that yeah. ticker. Um, I just turned 50 and I just, uh, it hit me. And now lipstick's on my teeth all the time. I didn't, no one warned me that happens when you turn 50. The old lady lipstick tooth What thing. is that? I Why don't does know. that happen? It was like, oh, happy birthday. And now you have lipstick on your teeth. <laughs> and um, yeah, I have to really pay attention to what, what, what I eat because it shows up instantly. Um, so mm-hmm. yeah, I do. Mm-hmm. Um, I, my big key thing is I try to just eat as many vegetables as I can. Good for you. And if, if that's my goal, as many leafy green vegetables. And the more I can put those into my day, that's my goal for this year anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a smart goal. Yeah. That's a yes. good goal. And, you know, we talked to about the way foods, the, the quality of our foods today. What is grown, you know, the farm to table, the GMOs, monitoring that kind of thing, organics, grass fed uh, farms or those things, you know, whether it's aquaponics, it's greenhouses. Oh. What? Tell us more about how you kind of assess that in your recipes. Mm-hmm. Do you incorporate that? How do you feel about where we are with food today? Yeah, you know, according the ATK sort of tagline is unless it affects the flavor, the availability, or the ease of cooking, um, we're probably not going to focus on it too much because it's just very political, it's very polarizing, and it doesn't tell you if a recipe is going to work or not. So our goal is to help teach people to cook. But in circles, of course we have strong opinions. And the one thing that I'm struck with that I hear over and over from my younger cousins and their children are the environmental and sustainability issues. And so I have young cousins who, um, they call themselves convenient vegans. And I said, what is that? And they said, well, we won't eat we won't buy beef, but if you make it for us, we'll eat it. <laughs> and because they, they don't want to contribute, but if it's done, it's done. And they're also really worried about cost. And food costs are rising incredibly. Mm. Bridget, you mentioned they went up 18% this month. Yeah, I was and, just and watching the news right around here. There's something like mm-hmm. an 18% increase mm-hmm. in food costs in the area. Mm-hmm. Um, that's yeah. enough that that can change how you eat and what you cook at home. And you do, you do have to, if, if you have this knowledge, if you have recipes that will work, you can you can also kind of watch for foods that are maybe coming up. Mm-hmm. Thanksgiving's coming mm-hmm. up. Maybe buy that turkey when it's at a special price. Mm-hmm. Uh, look for the ingredients that you're going to be cooking. Plan. Our grandmothers planned food. Yes. My grandmother used to keep a journal, mm-hmm. and she would plan the whole week out mm-hmm. so that she wasn't running back to the supermarket every couple of days. And I think that is just a it's, – and it's more environmentally sound. You're mm-hmm. using less gas to get to the grocery store. Mm-hmm. I think that might, might be uh, – uh, we're getting a little bit of a wake-up call, um, yes. and it's going to change how we cook. Mm-hmm. Um, and hopefully, we'll appreciate food a little bit more. Mm-hmm. The other thing I see is portion sizes are beca- getting becoming more accurate, right? Uh, I think over oversized portions are out are becoming out of fashion. Thank goodness. Yes. I mean, it's one thing if you go out to dinner and you think you're going to eat that the next day for lunch and maybe for dinner, but That's great. portion sizes have gotten insane. And you know. A, proper portion size right you're eating less you're eating more healthfully you're um, consuming less it's more environmentally sound and so yeah that's the other aspect I, I really I hope becomes more popular well, I have heard a rumor that you do chocolate testing. Mm-hmm. And so tell us a little bit more about that and what what is it about chocolate that makes us so oh. addicted? And I'm speaking pretty much to someone who uh, who's in the room right now whose name is Christy. Yeah, you're, I'm just talking, you're talking about chocolate. You're just thinking about it. The smile got a little bigger oh, on your face. Oh, my yeah. goodness. I've been busted. Yeah, so I know you do a fair amount of that. So talk to us a little more about sort of the – I don't know. What, what is it we're looking for when it comes to chocolates, especially as we're cooking? Yeah. Well, chocolate, really, in a dark chocolate, there's only three ingredients, right? There's cocoa solids, there's cocoa butter, and those both come from the cocoa bean. They they, process, they grind it, separate it, and then they put it back with sugar in an emulsion. Um, and it's tempered. Temper is... You know, those ingredients can come together in, in seven different uh, crystalline forms, and one makes a, a tempered chocolate. Uh, so there's three ingredients. The different flavors come from the amount of sugar, the amount of cocoa butter. Cocoa butter is expensive. The amount of cocoa solids, that's the percentage you see. The higher cocoa solids, the darker the chocolate, because mm. there's less room for sugar. Um, Which right. is why dark chocolate is healthier? 
question mark? Yes. Actually, a lot of research says dark chocolate is quite healthy uh, for your brain. So I, I think every time you eat chocolate, you get smarter. Oh, well, straight thank up. That what it goodness. That's exactly your what it cheese, is. Your cheese, my chocolate. I'm yeah. a genius. <laughs> you, I mean, we've got this. And your pickleball. What are we going to yeah, do with exactly. Well, it does also. Chocolate has uh, all these neuroreceptors that are released in your mm. brain ah. that like tell you that you're more confident, you feel better. Tell me more. So the power pose it, of the food world. It kind oh, of is, yeah. I love that. I love that. I love that. Yes. Well, that's great. I love I love anything chocolate. It's kind of my comfort food. So I guess there is a reason that those of us are chocoholics, it sounds mm-hmm. like. Listen to your heart. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for the permission. <laughs> so I am very sad to say that we've come to the end of this Business Life After Hours podcast, and I'm feeling a little bit hungry. I'm feeling a little bit motivated to get creative and tackle some new recipes in the kitchen. Thank you very much, Julia and Bridget. So... We do what's called a little takeaway business after hours success nugget to leave our listeners with as it ties to our topic of building kitchen confidence. Mm -hmm. So one quick tip and a little nugget that each of you can give our listeners to. Uh, About cooking? Yeah, sure. Oh, good. Because about life in general, I can't tell you. Okay. <laughs> I'm still figuring it out. It is after hours, though, <laughs> so yes. I guess we can go wherever you want to go with this one. Um, two come to mind right away. One is about knowing the temperature doneness of your food. Everything should be cooked to a certain doneness. And guessing the doneness is for amateurs. Knowing it is how you take your cooking from zero to 60. And you know it by an instant read thermometer. They don't have to be expensive. They just have to be accurate. Um, And knowing what things should register. Pork should be 145. Chicken breast should be 160. Dark meat should be 175. Salmon should be 140. Once you know those. And if you don't, it's fine. You can print out a little thing. Plug it on the inside of one of your cupboards. Uh, medium rare is 125. Once you know that, your cooking will go, like I said, from zero to 60. You look, all of a sudden, you know what you're doing and you have more confidence. And you're not going to overcook something because you're worried it's not done, mm-hmm. which I hear all the time. Do you do that every time you cook still? Or Absolutely. do you just know? You really do. Absolutely. Okay. Um, okay. A lot of chefs do the finger test, yes. which I do, but I'm really bad at it. I, you know, chefs, I, and I'm really impressed with people who are good at it. I'm terrible at the finger test. <laughs> okay. And so I just rely on my instant read thermometer. The other thing is if you're new to cooking, prep everything ahead of time and pretend you're on a cooking show. Have it all prepped and then just stand and dump. Stand and dump in the pot. Take your time. Watch the food cook. You'll learn so much. It'll be much more relaxed and nothing will burn because you haven't got the next thing prepped. Yeah, I'm just going to add to that one. Yes. Read the recipe a few times before you get started. Make sure you have all the, not only the ingredients prep, but you have the right equipment for the job. Mm-hmm. Uh, because that's a question we'll get a lot of times is people say, well, I don't have this type of a piece of equipment. What else can I use? Uh, and then the other thing is never tell anyone what you are <laughs> making until yes. you have finished making it. Mm-hmm. So if you're serving people dinner, don't tell them that you were making chicken and it comes out burnt. You can say, I made blackened chicken, and or I made <laughs> rustic bread. If you forgot to leave oh. out the salt, a, 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 a Tuscan bread, or if something is kind of uh, not very attractive, it's rustic. It's very rustic. Oh, I love the word rustic. Woo, they yeah. actually the tray. Yeah, yeah. rustic and is a good it. hand. Yeah, and good have one. a good few restaurants on speed dial. Yeah, I like <laughs> exactly. yeah. I'm getting a better vernacular just kind of hearing this. (laughs) Yes, indeed. Well, my takeaway nugget is that there's a little bit of a maybe a chef or at least a good cook in each of us. If we can take the time to explore these tools, to gain the knowledge that you offer to us, to experiment with food, and to embrace the creativity and all of the fun that's in the kitchen. That's what you've really made me realize today. And we need to align with America's Test Kitchen and the two of you. So if Business Life After Hours listeners would like more information on you and your work, Bridget Lancaster, Julia Collin Davison, as well as America's Test Kitchen, where can they find it? Well, we have americastestkitchen.com. You can find out more about all of our recipes and everything like that. But for myself, uh, my social media presence is a little bit stunted, but you can find me on Twitter where I get quite snarky sometimes at Real, Real B Lancaster. Yeah. I love it. Oh, yeah. I'm often found on Instagram and Julia Colin Davison. And you can catch my own show, Julia, at home on Pluto TV, which is free to download. And you can catch me at your local cheese store. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. This has been fantastic. Thank you so much. Julia Colin Davison, Bridget Lancaster from America's Test Kitchen. And thank you so much for opening our minds to a deeper and more confident kitchen experience. Great to have you on Business Life After Hours and such an honor to be with you both. It's a real pleasure. Thank you so much.
Business Life After Hours is hosted and produced by Christy Kay. Audio engineering production and editing by Chris Pfeiffer. Be sure to join Christy for her award-winning television series, Business Life 360, the third Thursday of the month on WGTE HD or at WGTE.org slash B360. Business Life After Hours is a production of WGTE Public Media.